Hello, everyone. I'm Shane Cohen. I just want to take a second to thank all the incredible people that it took to put this on. Zas and, and everybody at Lanzine and all the people, all the jurors, and all of you out here today because we wouldn't have this kind of spirit in this room if there wasn't all this passion. So I don't know how many students there are in the room, but there's a lot of young people. How many students are there? Mm. I think for all of you, I, I wish that um, you all find the kind of passion that I've been able to find in this profession because it's a difficult profession. So if you don't, to, to, to meet the deadlines, it really is. It's, it's very demanding and it's demanding to make a business out of it so you have to love it. So I hope that each one of you finds some, what it is you love about landscape architecture and then you just let that be a part of your life. Cohen Partners is a 20-person firm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. There's three partners. Uh, Sarah Sawinski is here, back there. She's our CFO. And um, in anything that you do, it's about your team, right, and how you, you work with a group of people and the beautiful work that they bring together. And for all of us, <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of like how we how we learn to look at the landscape. Each one of us probably had somebody that was super influential, and then lots and lots of people. And I grew up with my dad, and this is one of his paintings. And he taught me to look at the landscape in ways that I wouldn't have ever thought of without him. This is another one of his paintings. And he systematically painted where he grew up, which is in the southeastern part of Colorado. And this is a place that's very dear to me because I used to sit on top of this hill with him and my grandpa in the mornings and watch the geese come off of this lake. And my dad would talk to me about um, lines, human, the difference between human-made lines and the natural lines and how the simplicity of a line that we draw in the landscape brings everything around us to life. And that, that really stayed with me. And when we spent time on my grandfather's farm, we would talk about these incredible gardens, gardens of corn, gardens of wheat. And my favorite is hay. And the way that uh, hay bales are stacked upon a field of hay. I used to gather the hay from my grandpa. All these memories from my childhood influenced the very first time I ever put pen to paper in school. I went over to a friend's house and I was reading some books and was completely tired of reading and went over to his house and he was building a model. And I started building that model with him and I said, oh man, you can paint with the earth. And that was like, the, the, I, I went and changed my major, you know, right after that. And that's what we get to do, we get to paint with the earth. For me, being such a lover of the rural landscape and the farms, my dad and I also used to talk about these developments that just started to wipe them out, right? Without any recognition of what was there before. The people that live in these communities may not even ever remember or think about what was there before because we're not giving them context or meaning. We're just erasing that. And so it's, it's super interesting to me that you know, the angels, one of my first project in, in my career was to walk upon this piece of land right here and be asked to create a new community. And I remember standing at this point, I walked through a big cornfield and I got to right here with my partner, my founding partner, that um, John Stump, who I owe so much to. He left after seven years. But we stood right here and we looked out and we said, man, we have to, we have to do something that respects this land and that connects the people to the land. So we walked that day. And that's what we have to always do when we study a piece of land, right? We can't design it in our offices. You have to go out on that land and ask it, what should I do? After I circled this hill about three or four times with my partner, we said, all the roads should revolve around this hill, this whale's back. When we walked out into the surrounding prairie, the undisturbed prairie, we vowed not to touch it, 
to protect it so everybody could look out onto it. We went down into town. It was this, it's, the, it's the birthplace of Minnesota. We studied all the architecture. We studied the codes. The houses were like seven feet from the house. There was no road wider than 18 feet. And we had 42 town planning commissions in that town hall there on the right. And the first time we went in there to propose developing on a piece of land that was bigger than 90% of the development rights left in that town, the town hall was packed with angry people that did not want development. And so instead of showing them any solutions, as Dennis talked about, we talked to them about their town. And we said, you know your town, it's, it's, it's got narrow roads, There's the, the houses have this kind of very, uh, nothing's regular, there's a very interesting pattern that happens around. And we said, it, you just spent all this money writing your code, and you know if we followed your code, we couldn't build your town up on this hill. So you need to work with us, and we need to rewrite your code so that we can create kind of a modern day emulation of Marine on St. Croix. And so the first thing is we did was we planted the entire site with one grass, <laughs> little blue stem. That was our garden, 375 acres. And we created a plan that surrounded it with conservation forever. And we started working with an architect, David Samoa, on these very minimal white Scandinavian, modern emulations of a Scandinavian architecture. And we created these rules. No house could be wider than 24 feet. Why is that? so the light can meet you in the center of each room. Even though we live in the winter, you had to have a detached garage so that when you walked from your garage to your front door, you felt the air and you looked at your neighbor and you were connected to the people and the earth. And then it's our job as landscape architects to place architecture but you're not gonna just go out and tell an architect that you're gonna have to build a relationship with them where they actually understand that you see the land different than them. And that by placing a piece of architecture horizontally and vertically, you can create a more dynamic experience for the person that lives there and the person that visits there. It's often the spaces in between and what we don't do that creates magic. For us, Contrasting nature when you're in a rural landscape is what really celebrates it. When you try to pretend like your Mother Earth, you, you take, you take the, the magic away from the surrounding environment. So these very simple gardens that reverberate out from a house and a piece of architecture where the house is an equal part of the garden as what you're creating. And what you're really doing is you're presenting the surrounding landscape in your moves. And this is my son looking for crawdads. I lived here for 16 years. So as I mentioned, we're a team. And in our office, our goal is to inspire the people that walk upon you know, our landscapes. We believe that everywhere you work, that context will tell you what to do. There's a deep exploration that happens to go back and look at that piece of land, as Chloe was just talking about, what was growing here what was here before us, and then what is the land telling us to do now, and then minimal. We call it contextual minimalism. Actually, our book just came out last week um, on this topic, which is, 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 a, is, a, is a deep belief that the context will come up with a unique solution. We're not inventing it. We don't need to invent it. We need to just find the story in that context. And then minimal. We have a, a phrase in our office called design with deduction. Solve the program which, with as few lines as possible, as powerful lines as you can make, as few as you need. Once you have that framework, you can layer stuff in, layer back in illusion and magic and all these types of things. So that's just a very simple. So a couple of really early projects, I, 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 re, I always like remember this one because we were sitting in this house and this, the, the client, husband and wife, Peter, wanted a sauna and a, a sleep house. And he was imagining a garden around it and a lot of intervention. And we, we said, the, you know, the garden's right there. 
And so David and Gladys and I studied this piece of land and said, you know, the intervention is, needs to be so minimal. Just find the perfect group of five trees and place the structure on a plinth, you know, two and a half inches above the grade and just let the person experience the incredible surroundings. In Chicago, um, we recently finished a project, and I'm showing all just, just a few private projects today, not in entirety, just to talk about principles, and then I'll show Lake Marion. Um, in Chicago, the whole neighborhood was steel, and galvanized steel, and Cortin, and red brick, and I started working on a collaboration with um, Brad Lynch and my team, and we started exploring ways where we could take that old gritty material and pull it into a piece of architecture in a garden where you blur the lines between architecture and landscape architecture, which is always our goal. We want somebody to come and say, I can't tell the difference where, what the architect did and what the landscape architect did. I love that. That means we collaborated. We created a project. So here you have an orange rug on the inside, you have a green rug on the outside. Same floor, you know, going in to out. Same elevation. The fence was a, was a study, you know, they always look so simple, but you think back to all those studies your incredible team did for you, right? So each one of these louvers rotated at a different angle in order to bring light and shadow and illusion, you know, into this garden. So it's just birch trees and cortent steel and granite. It doesn't need to be more than that. Two simple spaces with a space in the middle to look up at the sky, and the whole house revolves around the garden. So you're always in the garden, whether you're in or out. And when you're in the garden, you're connected back to your house and the sky. That's the advantage we have. We get to connect people to the sky, right, versus architects. And when you're working next to something powerful like a lake, I think the geometry even becomes more important to simplify. And same with the, with the palette. You know, we used to say, if you want five plants, you better have five acres. It was a joke, but very minimal. We just kind of use these patterns in the landscape to accentuate the geometry that contrasts nature. In Beverly Hills, it's kind of void of the old context that was ever there. So they, they, there we went out into the orchards and we found some old ancient olive trees. And then because they're in such a busy world every day, these clients, we really sought to just calm them down, to, to, to create a space in the backyard that they could come every day and just quiet their mind and connect with their friends, their wife, their husband, their kids. And so these quiet elements of just water and repetition and ancient olives is what we use to do that. I think this is like the core of, when we start a practice, it's really important to define what we believe in. You know, and to me, this was like it in the beginning. It just distill it down to what we're gonna to try to do with our landscape. So this is Lake Marion, this is in uh, Woodland, Minnesota. Just finished this project. Actually, just have one round of photographs to share with you. But I'll never forget walking this, pro this site for the first time with the client. The 10 acre peninsula. It was the most kind of delicate, beautiful site, crunching through the snow, actually, the first time I was with them out along this peninsula that went out on this point. And they were talking about soccer fields and <laughs> play areas and all these things for their kids. And, but what I really got them to say is what they wanted to do was walk in the landscape with their kids. And they wanted their, their kids and their friends to experience nature. And so what we did was we just started studying these simple lines that would pierce through this peninsula that would take you on a journey that would introduce you to all the different parts of, the, of this site in a way that did not take away from the site. And the other thing we did is we deducted a lot of trees because we found out that this was an oak savanna initially. And we were able to go in front of the Conservation Commission and propose that we removed all the trees other than the oaks. 
um, in the area that was actually the savanna. Then we tested the soil and we put back the wildflowers and grasses that were originally there. So again, the geometry looks really simple, but what makes something like this powerful is when you return to the site over and over and over again, and you test your ideas. Is that line in the right place? What do I feel when I walk here versus here? What if we stretch that path out over the water? What if we create a place to sit in the tree, you know, here? So around the house, the house is big, but when you get to the back, you see the horizontal lines of the house, and the horizontal lines of the landscape start to relate to the paths that take you out into the landscape and the simple concrete material. So the only materials we proposed out on this peninsula was concrete, and we just took native stone and mixed it in the concrete and sandblasted it, and a recycled ash, wood. And then three was taking all the wood from the trees that we are chopping down and to create an art installation called Art Lines in the landscape. So here you see the recycled wood just kind of floating over this peninsula. This is one of the journeys across from the peninsula side to the wood side. And you can see the simplicity of the lines in the distance here across the wetlands of those lines. And it's very important, the elevation of each one, so it's not, it's complementing the surrounding. And that big V is all the little twigs from the trees that we chopped up that we just stuck in the ground. And you'll see some close-ups where we just, you know, arranged them, arranged them, arranged them. So when the paths come together, the, 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 the sticks that were always growing there <laughs> from the invasive species were actually reused. We took the invasive species and reused them. Here you can kind of see one of the paths piercing through to the left and then the path to the right. And this is, again, why you go out in the field and you test where that line should go to pierce through those trees and have your mind quiet. On the left is a hill that's always filled with chanterelles in the spring, so I like to go out here in the spring and pick some mushrooms. And then here you see the, the art lines. So the line bends here because the topography told us to bend, but yet we wanted to invite people to keep walking so, so the, the sticks were, I don't think they'll keep out a lion, Chloe, but they'll, they'll make you think about life and what was there. This is the first time we've ever shown this project, so we just finished it. They like it so much, they always, you know, to me the biggest reward is when a client comes to you and says, I couldn't have ever imagined anything like this. And I just wanna bring people here. Just like start inviting museums and schools and like, you know, it doesn't matter, like our place is your place. And that's, you know, where they're at right now. So you take a private garden and turn it into a public element, which I think is what's needed here. And then this goes through the maple basswood forest and there's often just a simple bench to sit down on and contemplate breathe, a place to sit, meditation space. A place to gather, have a fire. I think this was one of my favorite art installations was the, was the wood uh, within the floor. You know, and this is why every person you hire in your office is so important. You want to hire people that just have deep passion, right? There's people out in the field saying, hey, what are we going to do with all this wood? We should do something cool with this. So then we start. So sorry to shock you, right, with a big image, right? <laughs> But the question becomes, you know, as we really think about the public realm, because our, 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 the beginning of our practice was all in the private realm, right? And now we're moving to the public realm. Can this same philosophy of a simplicity of geometry and simple materials connect kids to each other and, and to their surroundings? And we definitely think that it can. And so we're, we have a series of really big public initiatives. This is a mile long waterfront. And again, I think our role as landscape architects in this one, we're leading this. 
We've recommended, we hired shop architects, recommended to the client to do the Performing Arts Center. We brought in a whole team of architects to build a whole new community in this kind of disadvantaged piece in Minneapolis where we're just creating this mile-long promenade along the river, you know, really recreating the history that was there and putting a team of talented, passionate architects together. That's our role. Our role is to promote meaningful architecture, to complement our projects. Saudi Arabia, we're doing a lot of very large spaces. They don't have real public realm there right now. And we're creating parks and, and communities that, um, in this case, these giant canopies are a collaboration with the structural engineer, uh, Cone Partners and the structural engineer, um, that are based upon star-shaped sand dunes. And they, they pull people into them and hope them connect to a context with an Arabic pattern and a and a botanical garden, or an, a neighborhood that's organized around a sunken wadi park, so the whole neighborhood is organized around the park. But imagine how different this neighborhood would be without the trees or this runnel. So we're placing these neighborhoods, writing the zoning for them, talking about what sort of architecture, putting the architecture teams together, and creating a meaningful public space that will make people connect to themselves and each other like they've never done in Saudi Arabia. There is no, everybody drives and they go right into their garage. So we're creating a series of neighborhoods where they will connect with each other. Big moves. This is a 134 kilometer park that we're designing there right now. So I think to us, so many lessons were found in the private realm about our intention with design and where the meaning should come from with each project. And now, you know, we're really interested in bringing that to the masses, but we're interested in that same sort of deep contextual research um, that will bring meaning to each of these, you know, much more, uh, much, much larger projects. So I really appreciate your attention and your passion, and I look forward to talking to any of you afterwards. Thanks so much. Yeah.